goes, guys. Good afternoon, and welcome to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. This is where you'll meet some of the most talented, intelligent, and incredible people who come to share tips, resources, and knowledge on various topics. My guests come from many industries that include music, television, theater, community advocates, health and wellness, culinary arts, hospitality management, and so much more. Join me today with my guests, Mr. Bob Sargent and Nick Francis. So Nick Francis is a producer and host of Quiet Music, an online music program. And Bob Sargent is the 49ers Director of Broadcast Partnerships. Welcome, guys. Great to see you. Yes. Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> this is going to be so exciting. So before we get into our conversation about remembering Steve Feinstein, who was the former program director at KKSF Radio, I'd like to read a little bit about my guest. So Nick Francis was born and raised in Los Angeles. He is currently living outside Seattle, Washington, longtime radio broadcaster. He has worked in Santa Fe, San Francisco, Seattle, Phoenix, and Atlanta, producer and host of Quiet Music, and online music program. And we'll learn a little bit more about his Quiet Music program as we get later into the interview. Bob Sargent is in his 17th season with the 49ers and sixth as a director of broadcast partnership. Sargent served as the team's director of broadcasting and sales for four seasons. He originally joined the 49ers as senior manager of broadcasting in May, 2006. In his current role, he is responsible for all broadcast contract negotiations with the 49ers local radio and television partners and serving those rights agreements. He successfully negotiated unprecedented 10-year contracts with three major media partners, KNBR for radio rights, KPIX TV for preseason television rights, and NBC Sports Bay Area for television shoulder programming rights during the season. He is also responsible for hiring and mentoring the team's broadcasters, Greg Papa and Tim Ryan, and managing the team's vast radio network of radio affiliates throughout the West. Wow, Bob Sargent, you've been quite busy. <laughs> well, it's been a while, so it's... Uh... Uh, is that really me that you just said all that about? I'm not really sure, but it's been uh, for someone that's born and raised in San Francisco. Um, you know, it's been very meaningful to be a part of something that's kind of uh, passionate about. And, you know, the roots of it started with, uh, you know, just down that path with you all. Uh, yeah. It seems like 100 years ago now, but that really was the beginning. Hey, the watch beginning. your mouth. Watch I your know, mouth. Right? Watch I your know. mouth. Not 100 I know, years ago. The, I know. I know. <laughs> It feels like it for me. I don't know. I don't know about you. It doesn't for me, not at all. But <laughs> I want to start off by saying how much it means to me to have both of you here to talk about Steve Feinstein. You know, I've been thinking about him a lot. And when I thought about it, I said, you know what? I can do a celebration of his life. And I said, who would be my guest? I said, oh my God, easy peasy. You two. It was like a no brainer. I could not think of anybody else that has spent more time in a room behind closed doors with that man, but you two. Well, I was so impressionable at, at the time. And uh, I remember vividly when, when Nick came in after we had changed formats, I was with the station prior to uh, the, the format being flipped. And when Nick came, you know, I mean, what he and Steve did together was literally build the, 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 the nerve center of the engine. And oh, I yeah. remember those guys were putting in logs and Nick to speak to it. I'm kind of just turning it to him, but it was so impactful and we're here to honor Steve and all the right, but, but Nick was so vital. And one of the things I learned was watching Steve uh, and know how and when to delegate and know when to take what advice and Nick would push on things. And it was wonderful to observe. And so uh, Nick, what Nick and Steve built in San Francisco, which had never been, tried before uh was really really meaningful and long lasting and i, I you know I, I think nick you should be incredibly proud as i know i'm sure you are from from that time uh that you spent 
Yeah, it was a really special time. Um, it was, as you said, it was the beginning of a whole new radio format. And we were kind of playing it by ear, literally. <laughs> we were, um, I can remember um, Steve was very active and wanting to know what other people, other stations were doing. That's and right. so yes. this, this <laughs> network of radio stations and people he knew, and Bob, you were part of that too, getting air checks and tapes yes. from all yes. these different places. Wow. I mean, Steve, Steve, before he became the, the program director of KKSF, worked at Radio and Records, which is a, a was a music and, and records uh, trade paper. So he, he was so connected with everybody that he could call pretty much anybody in any market and say, will you tape this radio station? So, so he was, uh, we were just gathering a lot, a lot of information. And uh, it, it was kind of wild and crazy, but it was, uh, it was, it was happening. Nick, when you say, when you say on the fly, I vividly remember, you got to tell me if my memory is just getting foggy, but when you see on the fly, I literally remember the spreadsheets that were out there and everything had to be done in sets of three. That's what Steve believed in. Everything was sets of three, sets of three, sets of three. <laughs> and you specifically would literally, and he did the same thing because you were all doing 24 hours a day and you would hand write the log. Yeah. Yes, before, before, before the I arrived, it was you and uh, uh, and and also uh, some guys in San Diego who were working with us, Mike Fisher and uh, Bob O'Connor. Bob O'Connor, yeah. yeah. Um, you know what? Can I stop you guys be... for one second because I wanted to read a little bit about Steve's bio, but you guys just you know what? I know this is going to be wonderful because you guys have so much to say. But Nick, when you start talking about him being with Radio and Records, I said I didn't even get to read his bio. So you, <laughs> yeah, okay. Let me just do a little bit about that, and then I'm going to let you guys take the show because okay. I can see you guys are ready to rock and roll. So Steve Feinstein started his radio career in his hometown of Philadelphia, jockeying in high school and then at college stations WRTI, Temple University, and WXPN, the University of Pennsylvania. His professional, his first professional on air job was in 76 at the Album Rock WIOQ. Steve moved west to Los Angeles in 83, where he saved, served as the A&R editor at Radio and Records until leaving for San Francisco in 87. While he was in Los Angeles, he also hosted a weekly rock OD show on KLOS. Steve signed on with KKSF in 87 as program director and became the director of programming for KKSF KDFC in the mid 1996. He also produced six samplers for KKSF that raised more than $1.7 million for San Francisco Aid Foundations and other charities. This is just a tad bit of his bio, but, you know, yes, there is that sampler. Yes. Oh, Nick. Oh. So, I have a little memorabilia here. Okay. Oh, good. So you know what? Didn't I told you I knew I picked the right people. I'm loving this, but I do. I want to say this. Bob Sargent and I, every year for several years in August, because my birthday is in August, Steve's birthday is in August, and Steve and I used to go out for lunch. So Bob Sargent picked up that spot for Steve for me, and we would go have lunch. And after lunch, we'd go visit the Westin to say happy birthday to Steve. So Bob, I wanna thank you for all of those wonderful lunches and the memories that we had, the walks and the talks. It was wonderful, you know, just always kind of keeping Steve in our mind. So I appreciate that. All right, guys. So Nick, let me start with you. And then we're going to um, go to Bob Sargent. And then I'm going to open it up where you guys can do what you were doing earlier, where you guys jumped ahead of the head of my program. Yeah, I jumped ahead of my program. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's your program. That's right. <laughs> so uh, Nick, how did you get the job at KKSF as music director? Talk to us about that. Um, at the time, um, I was working in Santa Fe, a radio station called KLSK, and it was kind of a prototype of what ended up being the 
new adult contemporary format, which later became smooth jazz. Mm -hmm. But I was basically uh, the music director there and, and I had a lot of experience with a lot of this music. And so um, I was in 1987, I was, uh, I didn't, I pitched the job of being the program director at KLSK and I didn't get it. One of my other uh, uh, colleagues at the station got it. So I was kind of a little forlorn and pissed off a little bit, you know. <laughs> That's fair. And I'm looking at radio rec and records and I see on, in the um, first page of, of, the, of the paper that the KKSF, the change from KLOK to KKSF and the new format, which I was familiar with. And I'm saying to myself, oh, I can do that. I can be a director. I mean, I was just, just, I didn't know. I mean, I'd only been in radio a few years. So I sent Steve, um, well, actually I tracked him down. I called him and we had a, a conversation. And he was immediately, Steve was very detail oriented. Yes. Almost too much so. Almost too much so. <laughs> He's but a Virgo. He was, you know, from the moment that uh, we started talking, he was picking my brain about songs, probably because he was working on putting songs on the radio at the time. Um, but I, you know, he was just, con you went right at me. I was like kind of surprised. I was figuring I'd just talk to him a little bit and that would be it. So we talked for a while and then he said, uh, you know, um, I am looking for a music director. Um, why don't you, and then he got this big task that I had to do, give me like five like sample hours of, a, of the radio station you think would be programming. And then give me this other playlist of songs. I mean, he was really- Did you ask him, was he gonna pay you? You was like- you, oh. <laughs> <laughs> But, um, so I basically put something together within a few days and um, sent, it, sent it back to him, overnight, overnighted it back to him. And we then started this sort of conversation. Okay. That, you know, this whole process went on for almost, well, probably six weeks. Oh, wow. Yeah. But that, I mean, so that I meant was, the simple fact that he kept you engaged like that, that means that he liked you. Yeah, I felt encouraged by the fact that he was interested in what I had to say. And, yes. you know, sometimes I would um, present things to him and you know, there's a package of playlists. And he says, well, this is kind of where we're at. This is what we're not going to do. So give me another, try it again. And so, you know, he kind of, I got focused on what he was focused on. Mm -hmm. And then um, um, at the end of August, which was a month later, my wife and I and son um, took a trip to Los Angeles to uh, attend two weddings. One of my, my brother followed the next weekend by my wife's sister in San Diego. So in between that, while we were in LA, um, um, KKSF, Steve arranged to um, fly me up to San Francisco from LA. So I went in and uh, spent the day there and met everybody. Uh, I don't, I met Bob definitely. And I met you, of course. Yes, of course. I'm the first person you're going to see when you walk into that station. But, right, but <laughs> you know, that's still, that day was kind of a, still a blur in my mind. And then uh, about a week later, he called and said, you're hired. Wow, that's beautiful. So Bob Sargent, your turn. So talk to me. Um, about the impact that Steve had on your career, because you were very young, because you and I were at KLOK before it turned over to KKSF. So, Bob, what was your experience like working? Yeah, I, I was just out of school. And so, you know, the, the, the station that I originally was hired uh, and Nick referred to it, uh, Clock FM, um, run by Bill Davis and Phil, uh, Phil, Phil Davis, Davis. And Will Weaver and... Yeah. Um, that whole group and, 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 you know, I didn't know any better, you know, and we were like different format each day and, you know, listeners voting on records. And for me, it was just a wonderful experience to get thrown in a deep end of the pool because there were so few people there. So I, I learned, I was learning the business just through osmosis every day, even though I'm not really sure I realized it to that degree at the time. And then, so when, um, 
till Mel Rose and his group around broadcasting took over. I mean, it was like night and day. I was like, oh man, this is how a real radio station works. <laughs> and then you knew it was going to be a few months down the road before they would flip it to what they were really going to do before they yeah. really kind of had their hands around the place. Mm -hmm. And they kept things in very close quarters in terms of what they were going to do and what the format was going to be. And so Steve inherited me, um, you know, and, and, and thankfully for me, that relationship connected, uh, Steve's license plate was it's to laugh. And what we connected on was humor. And at this point, you know, I had lost my mom. I was, you know, 18, 19 years old and I was lost. And so that, that place was kind of like my family. And so I was petrified that I wouldn't have a job and I get to meet this guy and man, we just connected and we had the same birthday and it was just an immediate, um, immediate connection. Um, yeah. And little did I know. So when you say the impact on my life, I, I, there's no way to separate my life from without that time with Steve. And, um, you know, I look back now and realize all the lessons that I knew he was special. I knew the way he thought. Um, I knew I had never seen anything like that in my brief time. But of course, it didn't mean anything without any track record to, to know what that was. But I knew it was special. I knew it impacted me. And I wanted to perform for him. You know, if you remember, he would call me Ollie North back then. That was my mm -hmm. nickname. Because I mean, he didn't know how, but I would just get stuff done. And I guess to some degree, that's a big part of my role now. With the yeah. So, so yeah. I got a, a career out of that. Yeah. But, um, I think about his strategic thinking. I think about his decisiveness on, uh, you know, a, a, a sound, a, a, a song, a host. Um, I think about the way he treated me with such respect. Mm -hmm. um, so, man, I just, uh, but, but I think more than anything, what I learned from him was to be creative, be creative, live outside the box, so to speak. And he and Nick were living it every day, literally yeah. creating something from scratch. Yeah. And, um, you know, so, you know, he really, uh, he really, in that period, Dave Kendrick, uh, the sales group, you know, then I went on the sales side. And so it, 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 that was my path. That was the beginning of the anchor for me. Oh my God. You my just said the name Steve so profound. Yeah. You just said the name, Dave Kendrick. He absolutely adored that man. Yes, he did. He, he yes, would he come did. to me, Kelly, he would go yes, Kelly K. He would call me Kelly K. Kelly K. Dave, it's God. And I'm like, uh, your God, not mine. <laughs> he would go, yes. You, so we would have that banter going back and forth. I just miss seeing him walk through that door. Because when he walked through that door, he always had a smile on his face, you know, uh, and then he'd get back. Well, and only you could get him through the front door because it was just as easy to go the back way. Yes. Yeah, no, he loved quicker to his office, but there was oh, no, no he, way. Honey, he all, loved coming. No he would, there was no way he would do that, but there's no way he could do that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like that oh, would yeah. not have flown. Oh yeah, no, he definitely had to come to that front door just to meddle with me. He loved yes. doing that, uh, yes, you know. Did. So yeah, yes, he did. I just I, I'll never forget the day when um, I was talking to Hasefa and she was like, Kelly, I want I want to interview there, and I said, okay, let me talk to Steve. And I said, Steve, I have somebody that's very interested in the station, and I want you to meet her, Kelly K. I don't have time for this. And I said, look, give her five minutes, give her five minutes. And he goes, okay, I'll give her five minutes. So she came in that five minutes turned into two hours. Then they went out to lunch. Then when they got back and then the next thing I know, Josefa was hired for lights out San Francisco. And I, so then I would always say to him five minutes, huh? Uh -huh, uh -huh. So yeah. So no, he definitely, um, was a funny guy. I totally, and I think that that reunion that we just had was so wonderful. I know Susan Pfeiffer and Miranda Wilson made sure that I was going to be there. They were like, you have to be there because I wasn't going to come. I was not going to come. And then I said, well, you know what, if I'm going, Bob Sargent has to come. Well, that's, 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 that's words right out of my mouth. Like I had no plans on going period. I was summoned. Yep. I said, you know what? If I'm going, Bob Sargent has yeah, to go. And, exact, that, that is no joke. And TC has to go. TC would have come, but she had something else going on. So she couldn't, but she was like, thank you for letting me know. 
But when you showed up, I was like, okay. And yeah. then Susan oh, Piper was there. So, yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. So let's do some more stuff. So describe the San Francisco music scene, Nick, in the 1980s. What was, what was going on in the 80s? Do you remember? Um, well, you know, um, that's kind of hard to explain. A lot was going on in the 80s. It just depended on your point of reference. I mean, well, I'm talking um, about in terms of for the station. Oh, for the for what we what was going right. on. Right. Well, what we had going on was um, a very popular era where instrumental music was selling records and uh, selling out shows. There were some really great artists that were out there. Um, uh, people like George Benson and um, the Crusaders and Pat Metheny and uh, um, David Sanborn. I mean, those, there was, there was something there. And, uh, and also there was a great uh, kind of modern soul scene going on in the eighties. There was really interesting kind of soft rock going on in the eighties. Um, so um, what we ended up doing at KKSF was kind of a, a synthesizing all of them in kind, in kind of a mix and kind of one of the over kind of the one consistency over all the different styles is they had a certain smoothness, melodic quality, um, uh, delightful, relaxing, a, a lot of different elements like that. Okay. And uh, it was really fun to mix all these different kinds of sounds. Now, wasn't he also known for discovering new artists, bringing in, you know, um, later on, like Tasia Bell and some of the rest of those guys that he brought in, Tuck and Patty. Well, there, there were actually a lot of new artists coming because of this. I mean, instrumental artists that uh, um, weren't well known now could be, now could be known. Mm -hmm. And also during that time, uh, uh, a label that was in the Bay Area was Wyndham Hill. Wyndham that. Hill was like at the time, like this kind of quiet powerhouse where they had uh, artists like George Winston and Michael Hedges. And they were kind of in a way underground. They weren't mainstream at all, but they were selling enormous amounts of records. Okay. 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 Now, so Bob Sargent, what was a day like for you? Because you were like Steve's, what, musical? What What did you do? Well, what was your role? I, I didn't really, you know... I, Ollie North. It was whatever it took to, you know, <laughs> right. whatever it took for that given day. Get it done. Said, huh? a, lot of, a lot of it was research stuff. Um, okay. You know, I, I wasn't the music director, but I coordinated the music for the six properties. So okay. obviously, I wasn't going to be the music director for the incoming station. I think Phil Melrose realized early on that somehow they wanted to find a role for me. They thought I was useful enough to serve in some capacity. That's where that initial relationship with Steve was so important because uh, it was basically just his right hand man. So some of it was clerical, some of it was research, some of it was um, looking on and uh, talking to people that, that, you know, background stuff that, you know, like Nick said, searching for new artists, whatever it may have been. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Like my role was whatever charge he gave me. I know he got frustrated at the time though, when I would handle like he'd give me things that he thought would take two days and I would come back an hour later and be like okay what else you got and so, <laughs> you know I think he he struggled to try to figure out what the hell to do with me at times okay. I'm sure yeah. he would say okay. that we were here. yeah I've been um, I've been uh I have a bunch of memos that I saved from Steve okay <laughs> and uh they were important I kept the memos because uh, he always had really interesting things to say about uh, about about radio programming. In a way, he was my mentor. It yes, was my goal. yes, yes. My goal when I arrived there, I wanted to be a program director, primarily because I didn't get that job, that yeah. last job, <laughs> and I felt like I really this would definitely put me in a position to know enough to 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 do it this time. And uh, so I kept a lot of his memos, and I was just looking at him about an hour before we uh, amazing we, we met that's and beautiful what bob did was really uh steve made sure that the jocks who were on the air answered the phones 
got information about what people were interested in, any comments and everything. And then all of that would get passed on to Bob and Bob would collect this in this gigantic memo that he could pass out to salespeople, other jocks, whatever. So that was a, that, and for months, Steve was on the war path about this. Okay. Answer every phone, get as much information, your customer service person, and, uh, yeah. and we wow. gathered a whole lot of information about the station. Okay, that's beautiful. That is really, and you know, when you said he was your mentor, he was also my mentor because while I was sitting at that front desk, I was also working on my business and I was doing self-esteem seminars out in the community. So Steve would find, and then I was also becoming an image consultant. So Steve would find all of these different articles for me. And I still have all of those articles where he would put little notes on them and little faces and whatnot. He, he was great at that. <laughs> Yes. He and one of the people and one of the things that he did that that was really kind of life changing for me is he bought me this book called The Road Less Traveled. I don't know if he ever gave you guys that book, but well, that I was that one. Book. Oh, yeah. So he gave me that book. And matter of fact, when I was doing the hand painted pillows, I made a pillow for him and I laid the book next to it when I took the photo. And I'll actually post that at some point. But, yeah, I definitely um, he was definitely a mentor. I'll never forget, I was writing a speech once and I said, Steve, look over this speech for me. And I gave it to him. It came back with so many red marks on it. <laughs> yeah, don't ask if you don't want the answer. <laughs> That's right. I'm like, That's you so know scary. what? If you ever want to be brought down a couple of pegs, just oh, give him oh, some man. of your writing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll never forget all that red writing, but I was grateful. You know, it didn't bother me none. I was just like glad he could do it. Yeah, I mean, you wanted to be coached and he was coaching you. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So now, um, what do you think the impact that he had on radio? What do you think it was? I think in the sphere of uh, the format that uh, we created, he had an enormous, enormous effect. Um, I think it was um, so much so that 10 years uh, later, Passed uh, when after he passed, that the Gavin uh, convention, which was a big radio and record yes. convention, Gavin national, they, yes, they had a Steve Feinstein Award for innovation. Oh wow! And I know that he actually won the Gavin Program Report Director of the Year in 1989, 1990, and 1996. Mm -hmm. So he was well, Program you know, I, Director I, I, of the Year. I, I think for, it's interesting. I, I didn't know that. That's awesome. And I remember the Gavin report. Um, mm -hmm. You know, innovation would have been the key word there, right? Because that, that's really yeah. what it was. And I, and I think that what's interesting is you really got to give a lot of credit to Brown Broadcasting and Dave Kendrick. I mean, they were very focused on what they wanted. And they found Steve. And Steve was a unique hire because he had come from R&R &R and was a writer. So, it was, yeah. so they took a huge chance on Steve. Yeah. And Stephen Turn is someone that took a huge chance. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's the other thing, because in the radio business, especially back then, nobody took chances. It was just as safe as safe could be. Absolutely. And that whole true. station, that whole vibe, that whole idea, that whole concept was to take a chance. And if you were going to do that, there was nobody that had turned out on the planet that you could hire that would represent that best than Steve Feinstein. Well, then, and then look how he also was a part of the KDFC, the classical music. And from what was written in his um, obituary that I have, it was like he didn't really know that much about classical music. So this was new and he was just really interested in it and made it work. Well, he yeah. also knew, I remember him telling me all the time, like he, he always, and this is interesting, a tidbit I think for him because he always would would act like he was going to get fired any any minute and he'd always say well if I get fired you know I'll, at least I know I can write I have the ability to write as long as I have the ability to write I know I'll, I'll get hired somewhere yeah and it was that weird that's what geniuses are made of right that weird balance that they live between humility and you know fear of yeah. failure yeah and yeah 
you know, it's just, uh, it, but it drove, that, that was the engine that drove the whole station. That's why he was so crystal clear yeah. on what he wanted and what he didn't want on his radio station. You know, the simple fact that you just said that about the, the, the genius and the fear, do you know, I got a phone call from him where he was like, I don't know, Kelly K. He wasn't sure if he was going to still be at KKSF, like they were going to let him. I said, boy, you know, good and well, they're not going to let you go. And he would, I don't know, Kelly K. And I said, Steve Feinstein, you're not making sense. But, you know, I guess. Well, you know, as being, uh, I became a program director after KKSF and, and did that for 15 years. And there is an enormous amount of pressure in the commercial radio field okay. because okay. everything is driven by ratings. Okay. And every three months you have right. a new ratings book. Absolutely. And if you have a couple ratings books that aren't as good as the previous ones, you do start thinking about it. You start okay. working. Okay. Right. So, I mean, it's a very, it's very stressful on that level. So, so it made sense that, that he did that. It made sense that he did that. Then we understand why he felt yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 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 I like it. I mean, my life has become sports more than, than, than music, but there's so many parallels and a big part of what drives these athletes. It's not the, the love of victory. It's the fear of failure. They won't allow it. Yeah. They won't allow yeah. it. It's what drives them to work the way they do, to train the way they do. To, and, and I think the parallels are, are, are right there across a number of industries. Right. Same uh, with, uh, for sports, the management of sports teams. Well, it's because, right. And, and, what, and, that and, and, the, and the personalities. And I think yeah. you mentioned it earlier. I mean, that's kind of what I saw, you know, just the way he, it was the way he interacted with people because that is the common ground regardless. It's the way you treat people. Uh, the character and integrity that you have, um, the way you uh, the way you talk to people when you know the big bosses aren't in the room, that that's where yeah the rubber hits the road and you yeah. become yeah. someone that people follow or someone that's just kind of passing through. Yeah, and uh, that's the one thing about Steve. You may not lie, and I you know, but and, and I know it's one of the things we connected on, and I you know, it's just raw, raw human, honest emotion not yeah. in a mean spirited way although it could be at times but more just the truth yeah and yeah. and you know like i said earlier when you asked about the advice don't ask if you don't want the answer right <laughs> right, right. To give you the answer and i and i, right. I know that's what many people have right. said about me over the years right and i yeah. value that and i'm sure some of that was born from that time spent with steve yeah same and here you know, same here and you know what he loved his people that he worked for with uh radio and records because they would actually call so i would of course get all the calls that it would come in and i ended up talking to some of these people and i got to meet some of them because of steve and they absolutely adored him as he did him so he kept in touch with you know his friends when they would come to town, he'd make sure they had a good time. It was just wonderful. Remember the big sign, whatever that thing is we had in the the, the lobby where people could sign their names on it. Yep. On the the guests when they would come in and stuff. That I, was yeah. That was. I have some photographs from that era behind the people behind. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, uh, Oh, Nick, you got to send me some photos. Send me some. I would okay. love to see them. Yeah. No, it was wonderful to see that. I thought that was a clever idea to have that because people loved it when they walked in to be able to write their name on that board. Now, you know, Steve loved food. <laughs> he loved food. Uh, he loved wonderful restaurants. So we would go to a lot of different restaurants and he liked the little hole in the walls. He well, he like, did. In fact, I'll tell you. So again, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I did, you know, it, it, we were close and, 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 and quickly. And, and, you know, when I knew he didn't have much family out here or any family out here, and I remember one Thanksgiving, I had just got married. And we were, you know, I don't know how many people we had, don't have a big family myself, but I invited him to Thanksgiving dinner um, f with us. There was no way I was going to leave him alone. And when I found he's, and he came and, oh man, it was just, uh, he sure, oh yeah, it was, it was spectacular. Yeah. Um, and he did. He loved his food. Uh, of course, he wanted to make sure what music we were playing during the Thanksgiving dinner. And 
Yeah. You know, he had to be controlling that for sure. He had Oh my it. God. You know what? Dory would tell you this story. I don't know where me, Lino, and Dory were where we were coming from, but we were given these uh, Lino and I were giving them a ride. So Steve sat up front in the car with Lino. And I forgot what station Lino had it on, but Steve reached over and turned the state church change the channel. <laughs> and Dor- wait a minute, Dory was livid. He goes, Steve, you can't do that. This is not your car. <laughs> <laughs> he, oh, he, yeah, I guess he didn't that. like the song, did he? Right, exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. And you know what? He didn't think twice about it. He just reached over and turned the station yeah. like it was his car. <laughs> You know, and it didn't even bother Lino. It was like he didn't care. Yeah, so no, it was just no, like, good. yeah, but no, Tiffany adored him. We all really, really adored Steve. He's come to our home. So, yeah, so no. And he was actually thinking about buying his house, really, which was right around the corner from where I live. He was going to buy his house on Conrad. He goes, Kelly K, I almost been your neighbor. And I'm like, oh, well. It would have been fun. I think it would have been fun, actually. It would not have been boring. That is for certain. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah, so Steve is definitely um, just one of those characters that will always, always have a special place in my heart. And I know the same with you guys. And so, um, Nick, now I want you to talk a little bit about your quiet music show. And did Steve, did the KKSF have any kind of influence on what you're doing right now? Absolutely. Okay, talk about um, it. Quiet music. Um, it kind of all, the, the quiet music show stems from a show that we used to have on KKSF called Sunday Morning. Oh my God, acoustic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was the acoustic Yeah, stuff, it was uh, basically really quiet, relaxing stuff that we played from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. And I took hey, that hey, concept. Hey. I took the concept when I went to Seattle to be program director of Brown Station up there, which was KKNW. So I had the, and I still call it Sunday morning. And then a few years later, when I went to my third station, which was KYOT in Phoenix, Arizona, which by the way, went from worst to first in five oh, years. Oh, how nice. Congratulations. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. But at the time, I decided to uh, have that Sunday morning show, but I decided to call it Quiet Moods, and I was going to be the host. It was kind of like my little sort of side hustle in a way, <laughs> and, uh, and it did so well in the ratings in Phoenix. It was like number one in pretty much all demos on Sunday morning for like five years. Wow. And then uh, my wife said, you know what, you should syndicate this. So I, I ended up uh, basically syndicating, but I changed it to quiet music rather than quiet moods. And I syndicated it and found this, uh, a company to syndicate it. So between 2000 and 2008, I had like 75 to 100 stations playing the show. I'll be darned. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then, and then in 2009, when basically the format sort of collapsed in the radio, yeah. industry kksf went away yeah. lots of lots of different stations went away um i was still on kyot for a few years after that but then i moved online and it's and i've been doing it every week online i have uh, uh we uh, monthly subscribers and basically um you know been doing it that way okay yeah. okay that's awesome. wow that's beautiful. And so so working with Steve as his music director, you really was able to learn how to become a program director. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, I use so many of his, um, um, his themes of what he believed in. Um, and I brought, you know, I brought my own stuff into the mix, but I also learned a lot of what he said not to do. <laughs> mm, okay. Okay. And okay. so, uh, so as a program director, he, um, you know, he was my mentor on that level. And, um, you know, I, I had, um, you know, the Seattle station lasted like two and a half years and they blew it up. Mm-hmm. So that wasn't that, that great. And it wasn't necessarily that the, the ratings were bad. We just didn't have a good signal. 
So now tell me this, can you read us one of the memos that you've collected? <laughs> I actually was going to read this, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to, um, this was the memo that he sent out to the air staff when he hired me. Okay. It's from Steve and uh, the, he was always very clever with his memos because different titles and yes. he would have himself other Absolutely names, right. you know, but his, the title of this memo was, there's an MD in the house. A music intensive format like ours requires an exceptional music director and I've hired one. Nick Francis, who joins us this Monday, knows this music inside out, loves the Bay Area and has agreed to wash and wax my car regularly. <laughs> Nick has served at the, as the MD of KLSK Santa Fe for the last three years. KLSK was among the first commercial stations in the country to program new age and contemporary jazz. Now that we've got Nick's ears, Bob Sargent's operational savvy and my feeble mind all working together, I can promise you that you ain't heard nothing yet. Wow. wow. <laughs> How beautiful is that? That's awesome. Wow, I just got chills because I know I typed that. That's the thing that's funny. <laughs> it was also, bizarrely, in red ink. Ah, uh, yes. You, now who would do that? <laughs> who would put it in red ink, right? I don't know. It was, it was an emergency memo, I guess. It's in red. Oh my God. Bob, did he tell so you to funny. type it in red? Oh, I'm sure he did. If it was in red, it was because he ordered it to be in red. I, can prom I, admit, I promise you that. Wow. That is beautiful, Nick. So, Nick, show me. Do you have any more memorabilia? Because you showed us one of the samplers. Yeah, I have basically the first uh, four KKSF samplers. Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. And I was, I was part of the first one and kind of part of the second one. Uh, the second one was, was in process when I left. Um, but when did you leave? Thing, what that, what that year did you leave? Years later, also at, 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 in Phoenix, we had those sam. Uh, when did you leave, uh, Nick? Uh, I left in the summer of 1990. Okay, okay. Is and that when Dory, Do is Dory came after you? Okay, yeah, Dory, Dory came, came after, after you. Uh huh. Dory Stein. Now, Bob, when did you leave? Because well, I around mean, the same time, so I, I joined, uh, I, I went away from uh, the radio business for a very short jaunt to join a team called Legend Foods, and they made a baseball team, brought Homer's baseball cookies. It was like I remember. A cracker concept, and it was the first uh, thing licensed by Major League Baseball, the logo right on there. I, so I met through the radio business, I met a guy named Larry Brucia, and it was Larry's new company. And so I went with him as their regional sales manager to launch that product. And um, like most young companies trying to go up against Mother's Cookies and those others, you know, we failed. And so when the station or when the company got sold like a year later, you know, I was right around the time I had my son, 1989, 1990, I joined Legend Foods and I did some business with KNBR Radio uh, as part of Homer's Cookies. We did a radio promotion with them because I knew my radio background. And anyway, they would always say, oh, we'd love to hire you. We'd love to hire you. And so when the company folded, I, you know, it's time to find out if they were serious or not about that. And so they were. And so that was kind of how I went on the path. So I broke from the radio business and it was definitely still KK, K, KKSF at the time would have been right around January of 1990. Okay. See, and I left in 1980, 1996 because I was actually working with the plant recording studio. I was doing PR for them. Then I was, I had started my own business and then I, um, as an image consultant, and then I ended up teaching. I still do teach image consulting at city college of San Francisco. Mm. So, yeah, so it was a very interesting thing. And then I started a culinary program over at the Bayview YMCA called prime and prepped a hospitality management, culinary arts, mentoring and job training program to get, you know, at risk youth, the jobs in the hospitality and culinary arts industry. Spoke to one of my students just recently who was 13 when he started the program. He's like 22 now. He is um, still working as a chef doing his thing. And so that just made me feel so good that I was able to give kids opportunities. And 
I've spent my whole life actually working with young people, giving them the hope and the possibility of changing their lives. So yeah, awesome. so KPSF awesome. was wonderful. So people would wonder why is she sitting at this desk? I'm like, because when I turned that desk off, I didn't have to do anything but worry about what I wanted to do. Yeah, that's right. That's and right. And was able to get it done. And Steve Feinstein was such a hero and a mentor for me, providing me with information, contacts. It was just phenomenal. You know, Kelly, you were really good at what you did there. Oh, yeah. I loved you had it. a certain um, authority to you, you know, when, when you handle the phone, you handle people coming in. You were just usually gracious, but you were very straightforward at the same time. Yeah, because I had to deal with some people that was just not always just like, look at here. I don't know what kind of people sat in that desk before me, but I had to get people straight. It's like, look, I don't know what you guys think a receptionist is, but I'm going to tell you something. That's the job title. That is not who I am as a person. So let's not get it twisted. That's right. So, yeah. Exactly right. Yeah, so you I, I, the person, so you, you know, you took charge. I mean, you were like the, the kind of the, the middle person to everybody, every, every, all the energy coming into the station. Absolutely. No doubt about it. There Absolutely. Was one time, I'll, never, I'll never forget this. We had a, um, we were, we had Michael Hedges, who was going to be this amazing guitar player. And he was going to do uh, a live, uh, session just come in play and be interviewed and so you know it's I forget it was at one o'clock or something like that and I get the phone call and you're you say to me you're like whispering you're saying Nick, there's this really strange guy hanging out on the on the on the couch here and he's got this guitar and he's doing all this weird stuff I think he's like like a uh, like one of those bicycle messengers I don't know what to do so I went down so I walked down the 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 you know, and there was Michael Hedges kind of looking like a bicycle messenger with dreadlocks. Oh, and, my God. And so I said, come on, come on, we'll take you back. So great. So great. God have mercy. Was, yeah, when, no. I got, when I got in there, he was like playing this guitar and he had his fingers up on the neck. And he was like, <laughs> crazy stuff. Wow. <laughs> could see why you thought that way. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it was a fun time. I totally enjoyed what I did. There were moments, though, that it was not so nice, but for the most part, it was wonderful. Dave Kendrick was really, really kind to me. I know there were times when he wanted to throw me out that door, but I remember one time he called me in his office and he says, you know what, Kelly? I know there is a light inside of you, <laughs> and I'm going to make sure. Oh man, I'll never forget that meeting that I had with Dave. Yeah. So no, it was it was wonderful. I totally uh have some wonderful memories at KKSF. As a matter of fact, that's how I ended up working with Ernie Frager at the plant recording studio. He came in to meet with Tim Pozar. That you know, they were doing whatever they were doing because they, they were both engineers. And so Ernie told me one day, he says, You don't just do this at this desk, do you? And I said, No. He goes, you're going to end up working with me. And I said, doing what? He says, when I buy the plant recording studio. So I'm thinking, yeah, well, when you buy it, call me. <laughs> and the next thing I know, he actually, he bought it and he called me. Wow. And so, crazy. as a matter of fact, he and I are still working together right now to this day. So <laughs> it's just kind of cool to, to, to see, you know, KKSF allowed me the opportunity, number one, I was the first person that people met when they called the station. And so, and I knew how to work that phone. You did. I knew how to work that phone and I knew how to treat people. Uh, and Bob, you actually alluded to that earlier in terms of how you treat people and, you know, how people treat you. And it really does make a difference. It makes a difference. I don't know. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, no, we were definitely lucky. So before, as we get ready to close, I would like for you each to say parting words to uh, our audience about yourselves, about Steve Feinstein, and if there's any way how they can be in touch with you, if you want them to be in touch with you. Um, so, Bob Sargent, you want to go first? And Bob Sargent, you know I cannot call I your name. 
No, I know. No, uh, not necessarily. I just feel like I'm, uh, I'm grateful for that time in my life. This brings that back home for me in, in many ways. And so I appreciate you, uh, you know, setting this up. Hopefully it was some value to, to people out there. And uh, it was great to reconnect with Nick. I see him on Facebook every now and then, but this was totally different. And so I appreciate it all. And I think it's, it's, it, it sounds corny, but it really is the golden rule. Yeah. about how you treat people and yep. the character you have. And uh, this business and most businesses will test that. And um, that ultimately is who you are. And so um, don't sell yourself out, uh, you know, be who you, you know, and, and, and I think that's the other part of the advice too. Like when someone shows you who they are, believe them. Absolutely. <laughs> Maya Angelo. There's a lot of truth to that. Yep. Absolutely. A lot of truth to that, you know. So, Nick, before you go, let me say this: there is a scholarship fund that's been established in Steve's name at Temple University, the Stephen Lee Feinstein Scholarship School of Communication and Theater. So, uh, if anyone wants to send anything, and they can do it in care of Temple University Development Office, 083 49 1601 North Broad Street, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, 19122. Nick, what about you? Uh, I just want to say thanks for bringing me in here and great to see you both. And uh, um, I am in debt. My, uh, you know, I am so indebted to Steve for all the, for all uh, what has happened to me in my life, not only at KKC. KKSF, but beyond that, up until now, yeah. um, he's had of any person in in um, my career. He was the most influential, and he gave me the biggest break, and he led me on to you know a career that I'm still doing. I worked at worked in radio until just a few years ago, and uh, but still doing quiet music, and uh, I still play a lot of tunes in my quiet music library to go back to those days. That's beautiful. And, uh, I miss him so much. Yeah. I'm heartbroken that he's not with us. Yes. And uh, uh, I appreciate you bringing me on. And uh, I think we all feel that way. Oh, yeah. I couldn't have done this without you guys. So Nick and Bob, I'd like to thank you for being my guest. And I wish you con continued success with your families and your career. To my audience, Thank you for listening to Straight Talking with Kelly, where real conversations happen. Make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, share, and come back. All right, guys. Thanks Bye. again, okay? Take care now. Thank you. Thanks.